7.8. All right, history 3111, we're already at section 7.8 of chapter 7. Um, we've covered SN2 and E2 reactions in the last uh, re um, in the last lecture, and we saw how those are bimolecular reactions. They are concerted processes, meaning both steps happen at the same time. For example, in the SN2, it's a nucleophilic attack and a loss of leaving group occurring simultaneously. But now in section 7.8, we're going to get into SN1 reactions and E1 reactions. And these are first order reactions, okay? They only depend on the concentration of the reactant. They don't depend on the concentration of um, anything else. Just the alkyl halide is all we have to consider. It's first order kinetics. And uh, let's get into it here. So it says, take a look at this reaction. You take this molecule, tert butyl bromide. So that's this guy right here, okay, tert butyl bromide. And you put that in ethanol just in some solvent and you stir it around and you end up getting two products. You end up forming this ether and you also form an alkene. Now the ether is the substitution product. You can see the ethanol is uh, replacing the bromine, the bromine. And you can see that you eliminated HBr to make the alkene, to make the elimination product. So let's investigate this a little bit further. It says the substrate is tertiary, so we can't do an SN2. That's impossible, right? For, again, the rationale is that the reason you can't do an SN2 is you imagine a nucleophile, it is too sterically hindered to attack this tertiary carbon. It can't happen. So let's just erase that. That's a heresy. It's not going to happen. Okay. Uh, the reagent is ethanol. It's also not a strong base and it's not a strong nucleophile. And so not only is SN2 not likely, an E2 is also not going to be likely, right? Because with an E2, we need a strong base. And it turns out that if you study the formation of both of these products, the substitution and the elimination products, check this out. They don't follow second order kinetics. They follow first order kinetics. So again, this goes all the way back to your Gen Chem 2 days. And unlike the SN2 reaction where we would write the rate is equal to K times the concentration of the substrate times the concentration of your nucleophile or your base. Now, our rate law is just going to be this. The rate is equal to the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of substrate. That's it. That's all. It's first order. Okay. A first order reaction. SN1 E1. First order. That's what it stands for. And if you go back to my previous lecture, I said, you know, SN together, E together, right? It was a concerted mechanism. The mnemonic that my students use for this is SN one at a time and E one at a time. And if you're wondering, what do you mean by one at a time? Well, I'm going to show you right now. It says the mechanisms of this substitution and elimination with this tert butyl bromide start with the same step, the ionization of the substrate. And so instead of the loss of leaving group and the nucleophilic attack occurring simultaneously, what we're seeing is that we get the loss of leaving group occurring alone. It occurs by itself one at a time, right? First, we're going to have our loss of leaving group, and then we're going to have our second step. And so if you're wondering, well, why would a leaving group just spontaneously leave, as it, I have shown here? Well, you can see the reason why it's based on the structure of the alkyl halide, isn't it? Because once that leaving group leaves, we make a stable carbocation, right? A tertiary carbocation is a stable carbocation. So let's pencil it in here. This is tertiary, and now this tertiary carbocation can undergo a substitution uh, in order to form the ether, or it can undergo elimination to form the alkene. And it's going to depend on how it reacts with the solvent. So let's take a look at both of these possibilities, the substitution and the elimination. We're going to start by looking at the substitution. So the step that we saw on the previous slide was this step here where the tert butyl bromide just loses the bromine, ion, sorry, the bromide ion in order to form the tertiary carbocation. But the second part is where the ethanol, which is a weak nucleophile, comes in and does a nucleophilic attack. Now, if you're wondering why can it do that? The reason it can do that, even though ethanol is a weak nucleophile, you've got a carbocation here, man. That's got a positive charge right on the carbon atom that is very, very hungry for electrons. And so the oxygen, the lone pair in the oxygen of our ethanol molecule is going to be attracted to that carbocation and we get a nucleophilic attack, you form an oxonium ion. So this is an oxonium, right? And then the solvent, come, which is also your nucleophile, comes in and acts as a base and does a deprotonation, and there you go. So the entire mechanism is three steps. 
But the last step is just a proton transfer. We also call this a solvolysis reaction, okay? Um, solvolysis, this is a definition you should know. Solvolysis is when the nucleophile is also the solvent, okay? It, it plays both roles. So if you're wondering, you know, you just stir it around in ethanol? Yeah, that's all you have to do to get this reaction to work. So again, let's review. It's SN1 at a time. The first step is the loss of leaving group. The second step is a nucleophilic attack. The proton transfer is also a part of the mechanism too, but it just restores the neutrality to the molecule, just removes the positive charge. So there you go, SN1. Now, what we have to do is look at the reaction coordinate diagram of this reaction. Because we have more than one step, um, we're gonna get more than one intermediate, right? You see that if you start with your tert-butyl bromide, and the first thing that happens is the loss of leaving group, you form a carbocation, then that undergoes a nucleophilic attack, you form another intermediate, which is this oxonium, and then you have another small activation energy for the proton transfer, and that gives you the final product. Well, something that you probably notice here, and this goes back to your Gen Chem 1 days, if you look at these steps, right, you would say that, um, where's my blue pen? You would say that this is a step here, right, to get to this intermediate, right, this is another step, right, then this, if you look at all three of these steps, which one of those steps has the largest activation energy? Well, it's gonna be this step by a long shot, right? The loss of leaving group is the, has the highest activation energy. So let's put that in here, highest, highest activation energy. And so if we look at a bunch of different steps in a reaction pathway, the one with the highest activation energy, we call that one, the one with the highest activation energy, we call it the rate determining step, okay? So these two things are tied together. The step with the highest activation energy is the rate determining step. And so the formation of the carbocation, or you, if you wanna call it the loss of leaving group, that is the rate determining step. And that's something that I want you to memorize, okay? I want you to memorize that, and let's just write it down here, rate determining step for SN1 is loss of leaving group. The very first step is the rate determining step, okay? And the reason why I bring that up is Mr. Dion's been around for a while, and I've seen this come up more than once on a um, ACS final, or they'll show you a reaction diagram, or they'll say something about an SN1, and they'll say which step is the rate determining step, and you have to know it's the loss of leaving group. All right, so now that we have that, let's talk a little bit more about the kinetics. And this is probably going to be all review for you, but I put it in my slide, so I'm going to go over it with you. So just follow along with me. It says, since the formation of the carbocation requires only ionization of the substrate, the rate of its formation depends only on the substrate, right? So the activation energy is the highest for this uh, loss of leaving group, the first step, but it only depends on the concentration of the reactant. And so it stands to reason, and hopefully that makes sense to you, that that's why the reaction follows first order kinetics. That's why the rate law is nothing more than this. Rate is equal to K multiplied by the concentration of the substrate. And if you've forgotten what substrate is, remember substrate is our alkyl halide in this case. Okay, it's the starting material. So um, now it's clear that when a substitution occurs by a carbocation intermediate, we call it an SN1, right? SN1 at a time. Loss of leaving group followed by a nucleophilic attack. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me part of the way on that. Any questions about this? I want to lay some good foundation uh, here on SN1 before we get into E1 and any kind of detail. All right. Okay. Well, let's take a look at the mechanism. And I'm sure you all followed along with the mechanism. Of course, you can imagine that the SN1 mechanism, is it a mechanism you need to know? Oh, you bet your bobby socks it is, okay? So we'll put a star by that. You definitely need to know the mechanism of SN1. But it's just a couple of steps, right? First, you have your loss of leaving group, your LLG, if you will, okay? And then your NA, right? Your nucleophilic attack after that. So two quick steps. And it says here that, remember, when the nucleophile is a neutral species, um, an example there would be ethanol, like we just saw. Then you, do a, then you have to do a proton transfer at the end. But if your nucleophile is negative, then, then you don't have to, okay? It would just be these two steps here. All right, so that covers SN1. And we're going to talk a little bit more about SN1 as the day progresses, but that's kind of an intro to it. Let's move on to the E1. If you remember, the E1 was the reaction that formed, or the pathway, I should say, that formed the elimination product where we made an alkene. So, of course, elimination, you always make an 
alkene, and we're going to study alkenes in detail in chapter eight. So it says the elimination reaction for the tertiary substrate in an alcoholic solvent like ethanol proceeds through the two step uh, mechanism. So it's two steps, right? To, uh, so one at a time, okay? Or, so that's why we call it an E1, E1 at a time. So the first thing uh, is that we have our loss of leaving group. So that's step one. And then in step two, ethanol, instead of acting like a nucleophile, it behaves as a base and it abstracts a beta proton in order to um, produce a, um, an alkene. And it says here, like an SN1, an E1 mechanism is unimolecular, so it follows the exact same reaction kinetics. It's the exact same rate law that we saw for the E1 or for the SN1 reaction. It says here that rate for the E1 is the same as the SN1. In both cases, the rate determining step is the loss of the leaving group or the formation of the carbocation. So you see the activation energy here for either pathway is identical, okay? So the rate law is the same for the E1 and for the SN1, but you see here that in a lot of cases, the substitution product is gonna be more stable. There is an exception to this. If the E1 product is, um, so this is dye substituted, right? This is a dye substituted alkene. If you have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a tertiary or a quaternary substituted alkene, those are oftentimes gonna be even lower in energy than the substitution product, for example. Anyhow, I'm not going to test you on that. You know, oh, no, this is tertiary versus quaternary. I don't know. But, um, yeah, you can see that they're both very close in energy, uh, the E1 and the SN1 products. Now, something that you might remember, one of the gags that my students love to, to mention is how in organic chemistry, you learn all the reactions and you learn exceptions. Well, I wouldn't call this section um, exceptions, but there are some kind of a new nuances is maybe a more uh, appropriate term that we would use here. So there's some nuances that you have to know that go along with an SN1 and an E1. So follow along here. It says because SN1 and E1s proceed through what? Oh, they proceed through a carbocation. Well, we know that carbocations are prone to what? They're prone to rearrangement. If they can rearrange, they will, right? That's something that we've covered already in class. And so if you take a look at this first reaction here, we have the secondary alkyl halide. If you draw the product or the carbocation, I should say, the intermediate that's formed after the loss of leaving group, could this undergo a nucleophilic attack? Sure, it could, but it could also undergo a hydride shift, couldn't it? Right, this hydride could shift over like this, and that is going to give you this, um, oops, this carbocation. And so the first one that I had drawn, it's a little bit small, but that's gonna give you this product. And the second one is going to give you this product. And so you end up with a mixture. And of course you also get the E1 products here as well. And so you've gotta be um, a, kind of Johnny on the spot and kind of, okay, well, I'm forming a carbocation. Can this undergo a rearrangement? You have to be able to identify that. And you see, the, you see that in the next one, it's in a similar vein. Okay, same rationale. If we lose our leaving group now, we form a different secondary carbocation like this, but can this undergo a methyl shift? Oh, you bet your bobby socks it can, right? And so if that undergoes a methyl shift, we end up with this carbocation, okay? And the first one, could it undergo a nucleophilic attack and a proton transfer? Yes, and it would give you this product. And the second one would give you this product. So again, we do see rearrangements occurring with, um, with SN1 and E1 reactions. Now, it says here an SN1 on a primary substrate. What? How could you do an SN1 on a primary substrate? Mr. Dion, you told me so many times that there's no such thing as a primary carbocation. So how could I take a molecule like this and expect it to undergo an SN1 or an E1 reaction? It's primary. I can't just have a loss of leaving group. So don't write this down, it's a heresy, but this cannot happen, okay? You cannot just, you know, make this and have a primary carbocation. This is not going to happen. And so there's gotta be something else involved here. If you have your microphone off or on, could you turn it off? I uh, appreciate that. All right, so, um, you know, what's, what's going on here exactly? Well, you see that you get the product of the SN1, okay? But you also get a rearrangement product as well. 
in, oh, sorry, you only get the product uh, that results from a rearrangement. And so uh, what is that saying? So I'm gonna erase all this because it just confuse you anyhow. So what's happen happening is that it says here, remember a primary carbocation is too unstable to form. So in this case, check this out. The arrangement occurs simultaneously with the loss of a leaving group. So check this out. Not only do you get the leaving group leaving, this is your loss of leaving group, but you also get the rearrangement occurring simultaneously so that you only end up with a tertiary carbocation, which undergoes a nucleophilic attack followed by a proton transfer. And so that is why we don't see any of this product, right? You don't see any of this because you cannot just simply have the leaving group leave. The only way this could occur is if the leaving group leaves with um, a rearrangement occurring simultaneously. I would say this might be worth the value of, you know, a question on the homework or something. I don't know if I've ever asked this question on the quiz, maybe, but this is a, one of those nuances that would probably only come up on the chapter, maybe an ACS final if they really want to get into the nitty gritty of do you understand mechanisms and things of that ilk. Anyhow, so um, I've taught this class long enough to know that I don't want to spend too much time on this slide because we don't need to go into that much detail on solvent effects. Um, I'll just leave it this way. It says here, experimental data indicates that SN1 and E1 reactions are faster in a polar protic solvent. So just so you know, a polar protic solvent is one that is obviously polar, okay? But the whole thing about protic, okay? So protic means capable, capable of hydrogen bonding capable of hydrogen bonding. So if we look at, you know, the effects of SN2 reaction, so, you know, kind of mixing two different things on this slide, that's why I'm not wild about this slide, but something that you'll notice um, for SN2 reactions, it's the opposite, okay? So for an SN2, you want to have a polar aprotic solvent. An aprotic is a solvent that is incapable of hydrogen bonding. And so if you look at this SN2 reaction here, right, this is just a nucleophilic attack, loss of leaving group. The reaction doesn't work well at all in methanol, which is a polar protic solvent, right? Methanol is polar and it's capable of hydrogen bonding. But if you run it in DMF, which is, is telling you what DMF is, it's dimethylformamide, but it's a polar aprotic solvent, you can see how the reaction works really, really well, okay? So the bottom line here, if you're like, I'm confused, Okay, the Sparks Notes version of it is this, you guys. Polar protic solvents are what we, which are capable of hydrogen bonding. That's what we use for an SN1 and an E1. And a polar aprotic solvent, that's what we use for an SN2 and an E2 as well. And that's all you need to know. So again, if you have a solvent that's polar but can't hydrogen bond, it's polar aprotic. And if it's polar and can hydrogen bond, it's protic. Done. All right. So. Again, this is just rehashing what I just wrote on the previous slide. For an SN2, we use a polar aprotic solvent. And for an SN1, okay, we use a polar protic solvent. And you can see how it affects the reaction, right? What happens in an SN2 reaction is that when you run the reaction in a polar aprotic solvent, it raises the, act, uh, raises the, the potential energy of the starting materials, okay? And, um, and so that lowers the activation energy. Whereas for an SN1, when you run it in a polar aprotic solvent, it has a very high activation energy. And in a protic solvent, it has a very low activation energy. I'm not gonna you know, really quiz you on the details of this uh, a whole lot, um, but I would say it's worth knowing what's on this slide here for sure. And I think you could have guessed this anyway. It says the better the leaving group, the faster the SN1 or the E1. Well, that makes sense because if the first step is loss of leaving group, well, doesn't it make sense that the better your leaving group is, the faster the reaction would be? Yeah. So if we compare fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide, you know that these three are good leaving groups. This is a terrible leaving group. It doesn't leave at all, okay? A very no situations that we would look at in this chapter. And you should know that HI, is a stronger acid than HBr, and HBr is a stronger acid than HCl. So iodide is the best leaving group, bromide is the second best, and chloride would be um, the third best. All right, so again, the, the weaker the base or the more stable the halide, the faster the ionization will be.
Okay, a little bit more in this whole nuance thing about SN1 and E1. So, so far we talked about tertiary carbocations, and then we took a look at one that rearranged simultaneously with the loss of leaving group to give you a tertiary carbocation. Um, there are some exceptions where you see a carbocation that doesn't appear to be tertiary, but it will react via an SN1 and an E1. First of all, if you try to do a solvolysis reaction with a primary or a secondary alkyl halide, um, those are so slow, it doesn't, it doesn't work, okay? You're not going to get a primary or secondary carbocation, so you don't get any SN1 or E1 products. However, notice there's a disclaimer, right? However, tertiary alkyl halides, as well as benzylic and allylic halides, so you need to know what a benzylic carbocation and an allylic carbocation is, because if a benzylic or allylic halide loses its leaving group, it's the first step, you get a stable carbocation. <clears throat> I mean, why is the allylic carbocation stable? Well, obviously, it's because of resonance. And hopefully that's obvious. That's the first resonance structure that we studied in organic one in this class. And then a benzylic carbocation, you could do the same thing. You can draw a whole holy host of resonance structures for this guy too. And so the tertiary carbocation is just stable via hyperconjugation. But the benzylic and the allylic carbocation, those are stabilized by resonance, and therefore they are able to react via an SN1 or an E1 mechanism. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me on benzylic and allylic can react via an SN1. Why? Because you get stable carbocations. Yeah. Okay. And, and again, they're stabilized by resonance. They're stabilized a different way than tertiary, but they are still stable. So, You've got to be able to judge whether an alkyl halide is going to be able to undergo an SN1 or an E1. And it says here, in general, primary and secondary alkyl halides are only going to undergo solvolysis if they can rearrange, like I showed you, to a more stable carbocation. Okay. But if you have a tertiary, and th these are the ones you really have to know, tertiary, allylic, or benzylic alkyl, alkyl halides, they can undergo solvolysis to give you a mixture of SN1 and E1 products. Right. If you take a look at this starting material here, right, you might, you know, if you're just learning the subject, you might look at this and say, well, is this a secondary car? You know, is this secondary, this carbon? Yes, it is. But remember, if you lose that leaving group, you get a benzylic carbocation. You guys remember the benzylic position, right? The benzylic position is the carbon attached directly to the aromatic ring. And so if you get a loss of leaving group occurring here, you end up with this carbocation and you might look at this and say that's secondary no it's secondary but it's benzylic right and so like i said we can write all these different resonance structures i'm not going to draw them all right now but you could write all these different resonance forms and remember that the more resonance forms you have uh the more the carbocation is going to be stabilized and so we can get the substitution product or we can get the elimination product we get a mixture of both of these products um, in this case so again, just to repeat myself, like an old person, you've got to be aware of, what was it? Tertiary, allylic, and benzylic. All three of these are possibilities for an SN1 or an E1 mechanism. All right, so let's move on from there and let's talk about regioselectivity. Um, last class, we talked about uh, uh, stereospecificity, stereoselectivity. So what is regioselectivity? Well, it's selective. That means it's prefer preferring one over another. It doesn't mean you're only going to get one. It's not regio-specific. It's regio-selective for one over another. And regio means region, so part of the molecule. And so what that means is that like in E2, remember with E2, we saw Zaitsev, right? And we saw Hoffman products. Well, with E1, we can see the same thing. We can get Zaitsev and Hoffman products, right? You can see here that this is the Hoffman product, it's the less substituted alkene. This is the Zaitsev product here, it's the more substituted alkene. You've also got the SN, uh, SN1 product. And so, um, you know, if you're wondering, well, what's, what's gonna be the major product? Here's the answer, it's in bold. E1 reactions will always give the most stable alkene as the most, or sorry, as the major product, okay? Uh, which will be the most, uh, sorry, E1 reactions will always give the most stable alkene as the major product, which will be the most substituted alkene. All right, so if we look at the Zaitsev product, it is one, two, three. It's tri-substituted. If we look at the Hoffman, it's only di-substituted. 
And so that is why the Zaitsev is going to be the major. So it's regioselective, right? It's regioselective to have the double bond in this region, right? As opposed to this region. That's what regioselective means. Just erase all these carbons here. The thing is, do you remember with E2 reactions, we could pick a hindered base versus an unhindered base and we could determine or we could uh, obtain either the Hoffman or the Zaitsev preferentially. The problem is you can't do that with an E1. It's what you what you get is what you get. OK, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just going to give you and then you have to you'd have to purify it. Right. If you wanted to um, isolate one of one alkene in particular or something like that. OK, so now that we've covered regio selectivity, we've got to take a look at stereo selectivity. So stereo selectivity basically means um, when you're forming these alkenes, are you going to get cis or trans? Right. So cis. Right here. So cis versus trans for your E1 products. OK, um, so let's take a look at this. All right. You see, this product is tri substituted, as is this one. Maybe I'll put a box around them. These two here. OK, both. Both tri substituted, substituted. So why is the one on the left the major product? The reason that this one is the major product is because this is the E alkene and this one here is the Z alkene, right? This one is the E alkene is the more stable isomer. It's less sterically hindered. If you don't follow me on that, look, on this side, we have two methyl groups that are blocking each other. On this side, we have a methyl group and an ethyl group, right? An ethyl group is bigger. And so the Z product is going to be less stable. Simple as that. Give me a thumbs up if you see that the E is more stable than the Z in this particular case. Okay, cool. All right, good. Um, well, want me to sh share something fun, uh, not funny, but interesting with you. So if you look at this compound, I'm just going to redraw it out here, the way that they have it drawn here. A question that will sometimes ask people that come in for an interview, you know, if they're talking about organic chemistry, is we'll say, can a compound be E and cis at the same time? And the answer is yes, okay? If you take a look here, this is the most important or the group with the highest priority on this carbon and the ethyl group has the highest priority here. So this is an E compound, but you have two methyl groups that are on the same side. So this is also a cis compound. So a compound can be E and cis at the same time. OK, so that's just I'm not going to ask you that. It's just a question we ask people sometimes just to see if they know the answer. Anyhow, so where was I? So we say the reaction is stereoselective. You're going to get all of these different alkenes. You're going to get the Zaitsev, you're going to get the Hoffman, and you're going to get the major and the minor Zaitsev products, both the E and the Z. But whichever one is the most stable is going to be the major product. All right. And if you're looking at this and going, what, four products, and I have to be able to label them all? Um, I'm not trying to sound like a meanie or anything, but the answer is, yeah, you have to be able to identify all these different products that can be formed. But we have a methodical way of doing it. And we're going to look at that in just a little bit here. Now, if you're wondering about this whole loss of leaving group thing, right? Remember the first step in an SN1 is the loss of leaving group, okay? So you're saying like, look, okay, Mr. Dion, if I lose a leaving group, I get a carbocation. And this carbon is sp2 hybridized. Therefore, it's trigonal planar. So therefore, my nucleophile should be able to attack this face of the molecule or it should be able to attack the other side of the molecule. So I should get a 50-50 mixture. Um, you know, I should get a racemic mixture of the two products. And the answer is, in this class, we're going to assume that you do get a 50-50 mixture. But in fact, we don't. Oftentimes, we get a preference for the backside attack um, a, a little bit. And there's a reason for that, OK? So if you think about the nucleophile attacking you know, once the leaving group starts to leave, it's still kind of close to the carbocata. And so more nucleophiles can come in and attack from the back than from the front. Anyhow, so um, typically you get a little bit more of the inversion product than you do of the retention of configuration products. So you get a little bit more of the like the umbrella flipping in the wind. Um, again, this is nothing I'm going to ask you about. In our class, we're going to assume that you get receiving the mixture. So I'm going to put it here. I'll even put it in my handwriting. Assume, assume racemic mixture 
formed in 3101, unless it's a question in the homework where it specifically asks you about this topic. Um, other than that, on a quiz or something, you can just assume it's 50-50, it's okay? Even in an ACS final, you can do that. But it is uh, something that's kind of neat. And, you know, I remember, I think, pretty much everything that I learned in Organic Chemistry 1 when I took the class in 1995. And this is something that wasn't covered in the class. I remember my book didn't have this. This in, I learned it later on, but uh, this was not in my textbook. So something kind of cool. All right. Let's give it the old college try. Now, we're really going to have to take a step back here, take a deep breath to <laughs> solve these things here. So it says draw all of the expected products for each of the following solvolysis reactions. So I'll ask uh, Sean. Is Sean there? I think he is. I thought so. Who's here? Yeah, Sean's there. There he is. All right. So, Sean, you don't have to answer this. I'm just giving you a hard time. Where's my chat button? Sorry. All right. Uh, Sean, what kind of alkyl halide is this? What do we got here? Anybody? Primary, secondary, tertiary? I know everybody knows. Me. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Good. All right. So it's tertiary, right? So it can't be an SN2. It can't be an E2. That's impossible. We've got it in a polar product solvent, right? Ethanol is polar. And if you're wondering, what well, is the ethanol polar? Yeah, ethanol is polar, right? So you have your ethyl group, then you have the oxygen here, right? You've got a dipole going this way and this way, and then the net dipole is going that way, right? So ethanol is definitely a polar molecule. Can a hydrogen bond? Oh, holy hell yeah. Okay, so keep capable of hydrogen bonding. And therefore, we're going to have what? We're going to have SN1 and E1 reactions occurring. All right, well, let's just draw the intermediate for the heck of it. I got to watch my language here. Okay, so we're going to draw the intermediate. So we get our loss of leaving group occurring. So there's our intermediate, our carbocation. And then what's going to happen is we can get SN1 or we can get E1. Now, is there any reason why this would rearrange? Would this rearrange? And it's not a trick. Uh, this is not designed to fool you. Go with your gut. No, right, Sarah? This isn't going to rearrange. There's no reason for it to rearrange, right, Hannah? This is no point. So it's not going to rearrange. So we're just going to do the nucleophilic attack on this. We're going to do the elimination on this and call it a day. All right. So let's start with the SN1. So the SN1 is going to be a nucleophilic attack followed by a proton transfer. Now it doesn't ask us to write out the whole mechanism, so I'm not gonna do it this time. And so the SN1 product that we would get would be this, where you would end up with this ether, okay? So the ethanol would come in and do the nucleophilic attack, then you get a proton transfer and you get this ether. Now, for the E1 products, Okay, so I'll just write down here E1 products, and there's going to be more than one in this case, okay? There's going to be more than one E1 product. So you have two types of beta protons. You have these beta protons in red, and then you also have the, these two beta protons in blue. So if you pulled off the beta proton in red, you're going to end up with this alkene, and if you pulled off the beta proton in blue, you're going to end up with this alkene. Okay, my question to you is, which one of these is going to be the most stable alkene? The blue or the red? And it's not, a, I hate fooling people or trying to. It's not my MO. Exactly, it's the blue one, right? So the blue one is going to be the major of those two. So again, this is an E1 mechanism, and this is an E1 mechanism. But the E1 product here, this is going to be our major product here. So these are two regioisomers, right? The double bond is in a different region in each one of these. Just let me pretty this up a little bit here. Okay, the double bond is in a different region for each one of these. But if you look at either of these, is there a possible a possibility of having a different stereoisomer here? And again, there's nothing designed to fool you. There's no possibility for a stereoisomer here, right? Because if you look at this compound, Remember, when you have two groups that are identical on one of the carbons of the double bond, there's no cis or trans, so there's no stereoisomer here. And if you look at this, this one has two methyl groups on one side, or sorry, two methyl groups here, so there's no cis or trans for either of these. And so those are all the products. The question is done. We have completed the entire thing. That is it. There are three products. They, these are them. That's it. Hot dog, we have a wiener. Move on with life. All right? 
give me a thumbs up if you're with me even like 60% of the way on this because you will have to practice it. Okay. It's, and, and trust me. Every, uh, you should never trust somebody when they say trust me, but you can trust me, right? Everybody has to practice it. Okay. Oh, also one thing that I didn't address, Mr. Dion is slacking here, right? Is there a, is there a possibility of two stereoisomers for the for the product that I have drawn in black, the ether? <clears throat> Could I have RNS here? Because you form a carbocation and the nucleophile could attack from either face of the molecule. Could you have RNS here? Yes or no? No, because there's no chiral center here, right? So you only get this product, right? This carbon has two methyl groups attached to it, so there's no chiral center in the molecule, all right? So there you go. Now with the next one, I'll just warn you, it's going to get a little crazier, okay? So maybe I should move this stuff up a little bit. Can I just maybe move this? I'll move this over here like this. You can study the problem while I'm yakking here. Just bear with me here. I just want to create some, some room here for myself. We'll just put this over here. All right, and then I can delete this stuff. Okay, good. So let's take a look at the next question, which is a little more interesting, okay? By interesting, I mean complicated. Okay, so we've got a tertiary, tertiary benzylic. Oh, you bet your bobby socks, that's gonna react by an SN1, so, or in an E1. So it's tertiary and benzylic. That's a double whammy. This, this guy's just ready to pop, okay? And then you've got a polar product solvent, right? Methanol is polar, it's capable of hydrogen bonding. So this, the stage is set for, uh, for an SN1 and E1 reactions. Okay, let's draw the loss of, so we get our loss of leaving group in the first step. Let's draw the intermediate. So we're gonna draw the intermediate, which is gonna look a little something like this. Okay, like that. Mr. Dion, come on, the program. There we go. Okay, we've got a carbocation. So this is our intermediate. What is the molecular geometry of that carbocation? Anybody? What's the molecular geometry here? Molecular geometry. It's tertiary benzylic. Yeah. What's the molecular geometry? What's the shape? It's not tetrahedral. A carbocation is always what molecular geometry? Always. Trigonal planar, right? A carbocation is always, 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 always trigonal planar, right? If you go back here, what they were that's what they were trying to show you here, is when you form a carbocation, it is trigonal planar, right? It's all in one plane, okay? So if we go back here, we have a trigonal planar carbocation. So now that means that our methanol, okay? So we're gonna do our methanol, Right, it can attack from either face of the molecule. It can attack from the back of the molecule, or it can attack from the front of the molecule. And you are gonna form a chiral center here. And so we're gonna end up with two SN1 products that are stereoisomers, right? You're gonna have one where the alcohol attacked or the methanol attacked from the front, and then you're also gonna have one where it attacked from the back. So let's scribble both of those in here. So, oh, I mean, like that. All right, so we end up with a 50-50 mixture of these two SN1 products. So this is SN1. Now, again, I didn't draw the whole mechanism here. It's nucleophilic attack followed by a proton transfer. Are you with me on those two? On where we get those two compounds? All right, because now we need to draw the E1 products. So if we go back here, you know what? Let's just redraw the carbocation. Let me just... Um, Take this, copy and paste it. Let's put it down here. Okay, same old carbocation. Meet the new carbocation, same as the old carbocation. So if I zoom in here, if I look, I have my carbocation. That's this carbon right here. How many types of beta protons are there? Can anybody tell me?
How many types of beta protons are there? There's a beta, there's three beta protons here on this methyl group. And then you have two beta protons down here. Are there any beta protons here? No. This carbon is attached to no hydrogen. So we have two types of beta protons. Okay, so now the methanol can come in and act as a base. Okay, and the methanol can come in and act as a base and it can pull off the proton in red. And if it does that, you're gonna end up with this, where we have the double bond right here. Now, if it pulls off the proton in blue, you're gonna end up with a different elimination product, aren't you? Where you're gonna have the double bond like this. Am I done at this point? There's one more product that I could form. Does anybody, it's based off of something on the compound in blue. Anybody see what else I could form? The compound in blue, is it a cis or trans compound? Can it be cis or trans? Exactly. So we can form a stereoisomer, right? Because this is cis, so I can also form the trans. So I can also form this compound, or I have this. So this is cis and this is trans. And so I get a total of five compounds in this case. I get the two enantiomers from the SN1 reaction. I get the Hoffman product from removal of the red beta proton. And then I get a mixture of the, both the cis and the trans product when I remove the blue beta proton. So you get a total of five compounds in that one. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me part of the way. Any questions about that one? There's a lot of material here. Okay, it's not my first rodeo. I know that this can be intimidating the first time you see it. All righty, well then, okay. Okay, the next section, if you're a little stressed about that, the next section kind of deals with this whole thing about, you know, how do you predict products? You know, if you get a bunch of compounds in a mixture, you know, how do you know what's the major? How do you know what's the minor? How do you know the pathway? All this kind of thing. And, you know, hopefully you've seen that, you know, as our journey is on through SN1 and SN2 and E1 and E2, that, you know, there's a bunch of factors that affect, you know, whether you're going to get an SN1 reaction, E1, et cetera, et cetera. You know, what are the things that we have to consider? We have to consider the substrate, the alkyl halide. We've got to consider our nucleophile or the base that we're looking at. Like everything, the solvent, okay, let's underline that. Solvent has to be taken into account. Is a polar product, polar A product? And so um, it also should be clear to you by now that in many cases you get a mixture of substitution and elimination. You just can't avoid it. You know, there's no way to avoid mixtures in certain situations, right? If you take a look at the example that they have here, you have a secondary alkyl halide. Right, hydroxide is a strong base, strong base, but it's also a strong nucleophile. And so you end up with, you know, the nucleophilic attack product. So you get the SN2 product, but you also get the E2 products, right? Because it's a strong base. So, you know, you've got to be able to predict what's going to happen, right? If you take a look at this one here, there's also situations where you only get one product. Here you've got a tertiary alkyl halide, okay? And this is a strong base. Strong base and methoxide is also a strong nucleophile, but it's not going to react as a strong nucleophile here. It can't do a nucleophilic attack. That's it. Sorry, I was in the wrong place. That that this is impossible. It can't do that because it's tertiary. So the only thing that could happen here is that you can take the methoxide and it can behave as a base and it can abstract a beta proton and you get an E2. An E2 reaction occurs. That's the only thing that can happen here. So don't think that every single situation, Mr. Dion, I'm going to get a whole holy host of products. Not always true. Yes, sometimes we do, but sometimes we don't. And again, your job in this chapter, the hardest thing about this chapter is being able to decide, you know, when do I get, you know, SN1? When do I get SN2? When do I get E1, E2? And when do I, you know, what's the part of the mixture? What, like, you know, how many products do I get? And so, you know, do you have a, a system, Mr. Dion, that you could use to solve problems like this? The answer is to an extent, I do, yes. So what you're first going to do is you're going to determine 
the function of the reagent. Is it a strong base? Is it a weak base? Is it a strong nucleophile? Is it a weak nucleophile? And so you have to know those things. The second thing is you're going to look at the substrate. Is it a primary substrate? Is it secondary? Is it tertiary? And then the last thing, which is oftentimes the most challenging, is, you know, am I going to get Zaitsev? Am I going to get Hoffman? Am I going to get E? Am I going to get Z? Right? Am I going to get a racemic mixture? You've got to take all of these things into account. And so here are the two tables that you're going to use to help you predict, you know, what's going to happen most of the time. If you remember, I went over these with you before we even started the chapter, right? This table here with this red star by it is going to be one of your major things that you're going to have to memorize and this table here. Now, the idea is that you're going to do enough problems that you're going to uh, just know the function of a reagent. You won't have to memorize it for too long, um, but let's go over them here. OK, so let's start with SN2 and E2. And SN2 and E2 reactions, those occur when we have a strong base and a strong nucleophile. What are some reagents that are both a strong base and a strong nucleophile? <coughs> Excuse me. You can see the answer is anything where you have a negative charge on an oxygen. That is what we consider to be a strong base and a strong nucleophile. All right, so that's you're guaranteed you're going to get SN2 and E2, but that depends on the substrate. Now, if you're wondering, well, when am I only going to get an E2? What are these bases over here? You haven't even discussed these, okay? Um, here, to get an E2 reaction, you need a strong base, but you need something that's a crummy nucleophile. Okay, and sodium hydride, and you have the hydride ion, it's a very good base, but it's a crummy nucleophile because it's non-polarizable. And I'm going to talk about these two in a little bit. DBU and DBN, they stand for diase by bicyclonanane and diase by decade. Anyhow, these are both really, we'll put the very, very, let me blow it up here, very hindered bases. Okay, they're extremely hindered bases. And so that's why they can't behave as a nucleophile. They're too big, but they can act as a base, okay? So that's SN2 and E2, strong base, strong nucleophile. E2 exclusively when you have something that's a really powerful base, but a crummy nucleophile, okay? SN1 and SN2, when do you get a competition between those two? It's when you have something that's a good nucleophile. So a strong nucleophile is usually something that has a negative charge or a sulfur, okay? Um, and so those are the two possibilities. Maybe I shouldn't put, I'll just put sulfur. Those are kind of the, the two things, okay? So think about it, iodide, bromide, chloride. Um, this is called a thiolate, hydrosulfide. These are all good nucleophiles. They have a negative charge. Of course, they're nucleophiles. But if you're wondering, well, why would they be weak bases? Okay, and why are these strong bases? Well, that has to do with pKa, right? Okay, alcohols have a much higher pKa than the conjugate acids of anything I have in a red circle here. I'm not going to reteach that. That's covered way back in chapter three. But you should be able to say, well, I know that the conjugates of these are strong acids. Therefore, these are weak bases. All right. So these are all weak bases. But again, they're strong nucleophiles because they have negative charges. Now, if you're wondering about the thiol and hydrosulfide, why are they good nucleophiles? Obviously, they're weak bases. I mean, they don't have a negative charge. But the reason they're good nucleophiles is because they're highly polarizable, because sulfur is much bigger than oxygen, so it's a polarizable atom. All right, and then the last category is the one we see the least, but it's the one we've studied quite a bit this morning, and that is something that's a weak base and a weak nucleophile. It's basically an al alcohols, so ROH, or water. Okay, those are the two possibilities, right? Water is not a weak base, and it's, or sorry, water is not a strong base, and it's not a good nucleophile. OK, and so alcohols and water would be weak bases, weak nucleophile. And so this would be, you know, solvolysis re reactions, solvolysis reactions. OK, so you need to memorize this table to an extent. But you see how I just tried to go over the rationale of all the reagents with you as well. All right. So you're going to want to know that table. And this is the one that my students come back to probably the most um, is once you determine what mechanism is going to be favored. Uh, will it be SN1, SN2, et cetera, et cetera? Then you have to look at the substrate and see which mechanism is going to dominate. So if you have a strong base, weak nucleophile, so do you remember that was um, hydride? This was hydride, DBU, DBN. 
Uh, those are always going to favor an E2 because they, they're crummy nucleophiles, right? So whether it's primary, secondary, or tertiary, you always get an E2 reaction. Um, there are some variations on this, which I'm not going to get into in mega details yet. Just let me check my notes to see if I always forget if I go over this with my students or not. Let's but there is one exception in here that I've covered before. Um, yeah, we'll just leave it this way for now. Okay. And if we run into any kind of exception, I'll go over it with you. The next one is a strong base, strong nucleophile. So if you remember that was um, hydroxide, right? It was methoxide and ethoxide. So oxygen with a negative charge. It's a strong base, strong nucleophile. So if it's primary, you're going to get mostly SN2 with a little bit of E2. If it's secondary, it's, it switches. It's mostly E2 with a little bit of SN2. And if it's tertiary, well, that's too sterically hindered. So you get, um, you get exclusively E2. Then if you have a weak base strong nucleophile, I don't want to pencil all these in, but that's like iodide, bromide, chloride. Um, it was the thiolate, the hydrosulfide. I'm, ah, it was the thiol. It was the H2S, okay? Was there any others that they put in there? No, that was all of them. I penciled them all in. So these are all weak bases, but they're great nucleophiles. If it's primary or secondary, you get SN2. If it's tertiary, it's SN1. And then finally, for weak base, weak nucleophiles, so like I said, that's water and alcohols, like ethanol and methanol. Uh, in that case, it only works with a tertiary, or of course, it works with uh, benzylic. You know, for this one here, it also works with benzylic and allylic right that just gives you sn1 and an e1 and that's a mixture right and that's what we've covered this morning so there you go is there a lot of material in here to know you bet your bobby socks there is okay there's a lot of material here trust me i realize that but remember you're not the first person to study it and you won't be the last so it's it's definitely doable it's just a lot to put together so after you figured out the reagent the substrate you can say what the mechanism is going to be then you figure out every regioisomer that you can get, all the different stereoisomers you're going to get, and you figure out what the major product is if you're asked for it, okay? Um, if you're doing an SN2, remember there's an inversion of configuration. Um, I don't need to tell you anything about nucleophilic attack anymore. I think you got all that done. So I'm not going to go over each one of these slides here where it says step three here for SN2 or E2 or for SN1 and E1. These, I'm going to leave these up to you to read if you want. But look, I could spend all kinds of time going over this slide, this slide, this slide, and this slide. But I would rather get into practicing. That's the best way to master the material. So um, without further ado, let's see if we can take a look at a, pro um, a question here. It says, you get a secondary alkyl halide. Right? This is secondary. So we'll scribble that in. And then you've got strong base, strong base, slash strong nucleophile. So what's going to predominate here? The predominant product is going to be the E2 product, right? Because we saw that if you have a strong base, strong nucleophile, and a secondary alkyl halide, that it's the E2 product that's going to predominate. But you're also going to get some SN2. And if you're going, where do you get that from? Go back here. Okay, go all the way back here. We've got a secondary alkyl halide, and then we've got strong base, strong nucleophile. So maybe I'll highlight this, okay? So it's mostly E2, and you're going to get some SN2. That's how I knew that. All right, so then we go back here, and we say, well, if you do an SN2 on this, you're going to get inversion of configuration. So there's the SN2 product. And then how many types of beta protons are there? Well, there's beta protons here. There's two of them. And then we also have beta protons here. And so we're going to get a Zaitsev and a Hoffman product. But if you look at the Zaitsev product, you get a mixture of cis and trans, right? You get, this is the trans product here. And this is the cis product here. And then, of course, the one on the end, that's the Hoffman product. So there you go. Now we figured out all four products that you're going to make. And remember, the most stable E2 product is going to be the major product. And that's it. That's all. Now, I went over that example very quickly. I realized that. OK. Um, and so, again, there's only so much yammering on, you know, you can take from me. And so what I thought we would do is take a short break 
and um, I would get everybody to try these problems here. And remember, you're going to have to look back at that table to solve this question, 7.28. So I want everybody to try 7.28, and you're going to have to go back here and look at this table probably to help you uh, solve the problem. And this one, too, of course. So let's go back here. So 7.28. So we're going to take a short break. Give it a try. If you're watching the video, make sure you give these a try before you look at the answers, you know, and uh, see if you can figure it out.